Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to this third session of the webinar on using Earth observations to monitor water budgets for river basin management. In the first two weeks, we had um, first week we had gone over a number of data sets and modeling products that are useful for river basin management, especially to estimate water budget components. And last week, we had Dr. Ben Sajic from Johns Hopkins giving us an example or a case study of Nile Basin management using remote sensing data. Today, we have uh, another guest speaker, Dr. John Bolton. Uh, Dr. John Bolton is um, the Associate Program Manager of Water Resources for the NASA Applied Science program, and his research focuses on the application of satellite-based remote sensing and land surface hydrological modeling for improved ecological and water resources management. He's involved in several water resources management efforts, spe specifically focusing on flood monitoring, flood damage assessment, and agricultural drought forecasting and mitigation. And he works in a number of eight geographical areas, including the U.S., Middle East, Central and North Africa, and Southeast Asia. So today he is going to talk about water and water resources and flood management in Mekong River Basin. So with that, um, we'll have Dr. John Bolton. John. Okay, well, hello everyone. My name is John Bolton. I am a scientist at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. And I'm working with the NASA Applied Sciences Program, uh, Water Resources, and also through the NASA SEVERE Program. And the work I'll be showing today is focused on the Lower Mekong River Basin. Uh, my team has been collaborating with partners in the Lower Mekong River Basin for the past few years, uh, namely the Mekong River Commission and the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center. And the goal of this work has been to uh, trying to apply remote sensing and numerical modeling for improve transboundary water resource management. And the figure that you see right here is sort of a, one of the motivating uh, themes for this work is to increase water resource management, particularly uh, flooding and related issues in the Mekong region. So I'm just gonna get right into it. So as I just mentioned, some of the, the motivation for this work is that the Mekong is particularly prone to flooding and floods are among the most common and damaging natural um, disasters um, in existence. And particularly with the Lower Mekong River Basin, it has a lot of coastal low-lying regions that are particularly susceptible to uh, flooding. Uh, climate change is also anticipated to have uh, wide-ranging effects within the region, and it's likely to increase these risks of floods. And I'd also like to note throughout this presentation, and as you see here, uh, a lot of the, the citations that I'll be, and figures I'll be using, um, I have highlighted in this yellow color. And a couple of the highlights of, you know, why we're doing this. And, and really what we try to do in NASA Applied Sciences is try to move from data to decision-making. And hopefully we can mitigate the effects of, of some of these uh, early floods, and, um, like we see here that are threatening Mekong rice fields, et cetera. So what's important here is to understand not only the, the effects of these, but also the, the impacts of these flood events and to improve these disaster response uh, and flood mitigation actions for, at the local and regional levels. So the tools that we were aiming to develop are, are not specific for one just one region, but throughout the, the entire Lower Mekong River. I like to start off a lot of these uh, discussions by using this, this figure from Shunan from 1989, and we call it the water landscape. And why I think this figure is particularly interesting is that it, it sort of whittles down the, the major components of the hydrologic cycle. And you see here the areas that are that are in rectangle that are that are in bold bold print here. These are the major storages of water throughout the water landscape. And the idea here is how can we characterize, understand, and predict each component of this water landscape? So when we do that, we can reduce the uncertainty not only in these states and fluxes, but the propagation 
of these hydroclimatic extremes from one to another. So if we're interested in a drought or if we're interested in agricultural drought, not only when, when will that happen, but how extreme will that event be and where will it happen? So by combining observations of satellite, which I'll show here in a few minutes, with numerical modeling, we're able to isolate the movement and the propagation um, of the precipitation of evapotranspiration, for example, related to soil moisture and surface drainage and base flow. So what we're challenged with doing is as accurately as possible and as frequently as possible, monitor each variable that you see here in this figure. So how much soil moisture is there? Well, how much of that soil moisture is, is infiltrating down to shallow groundwater and how much reaches groundwater, for example? And how much of the soil moisture is, is made available for crops and plants? And how much is lost to evapotranspiration? So we're able to have a pretty good understanding of all of these storages of water and the propagation of these storages of water through the system by using in situ observations combined with satellite-based observations and numerical modeling. So what we try to do here, we say we're trying to close the terrestrial water budget using remote sensing. And essentially, if you look at the, the bottom left here, you see this is the, the energy balance, okay? And the energy balance is based on late heat, sensible heat flux, and surface heat flux. And on the right, you see this change in storage of water over time separated into precipitation, evapotranspiration, and runoff. So just like I mentioned in the previous slide of water, water landscape, we're trying to isolate each one of these variables within the water balance and the energy balance and see if we can close that water budget using remote sensing. This is a pretty busy figure, but um, we've it's uh, what it does is it shows you the different ways of using remote sensing, satellite based, based remote sensing, for capturing these different components of the water and energy budget. So, for example, today I'll be talking a little bit about the soil moisture active passive mission that measures soil moisture. We'll also be talking about the global precipitation mission, GPM, for measuring uh, precipitation. And some, other, and some other things using, for example, the NDVI from the MODIS instrument in Landsat. So this is a, uh, a way of taking everything back and, and putting it within the context of that water landscape. Because nothing can really replace an in, in situ observation. But the problem is that if you're able to say if we have a very good measurement of temperature right in front of you using a, using a, a temperature gauge, what would the temperature be five feet away or five kilometers away? And that's what we do by combining it in a modeling context. So if you look at the, the history of satellite-based observations through time, um, there's a relatively long legacy of, of observing the Earth from satellites. And here we see observations from atmosphere, um, precipitation, soil moisture, and wetness and surface temperature by a number of different satellites. Uh, starting from 1980 going up to the future. And as I mentioned before, I'll, I'll be mentioning, uh, I'll be discussing uh, the MODIS instrument, as well as instruments from TRIM and the Global Precipitation measure, Measurement Mission. So what's important when you look at this, starting about uh, 15 years ago or longer, we have pretty consistent um, observations of all of these variables. And that's great if you're in the business of global or regional hydrology and applied sciences trying to have a relatively long legacy of these observations because when you're interested in, in hydroclimatic extremes, like I mentioned before, it's very important to have a long baseline or historical record of that data so that your anomaly values um, have reduced uncertainty. So the objectives of this work, that what I'll be talking about today, are, are relatively simple. Um, I'll start here in the, in the center circle. We're, we're trying to provide improved or guided decisions for water resource management. And the way we do that is that we combine remote sensing data and in-situ data pro products with tools and models and 
very, a very, very important component of this work is that we're working closely with the NASA Severe MACOM partners and collaborators for feedback and contributions. Now for the NASA Severe project here, we've been working with the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center based in Bangkok, Thailand. And they are an integral part of this work because they provide insight into their, um, their methods and decision-making tools that they currently have in place. And they're also very, very important for helping assess and validate and vet the data and tools and solutions that we're, that we're working and providing with their input. So when we came up with this, the hydrologic decision support system here, we broke it down to a, a few parts. And we're trying to find, first of all, how can we provide a near real time based hydrologic uh, modeling system that synergistically combines satellite observations in situ observations and is also consistent and useful for our ADBC and our Mekong River Commission partners. So this figure here shows the lower Mekong River Basin. And a first part of this was trying to uh, collect relevant data sets. And we explored many different versions of digital elevation models um, and, and land, land use and land cover data sets. So uh, the harmonized world soil database was used in this work. Um, and I would also like to highlight this, these, um, these papers here that are referenced. And uh, the, they're provided in much more detail. A key part of this work is also the SWAT, or the Soil Water Assessment Tool. Now, the Soil Water Assessment Tool is a widely used hydrologic model. Uh, it's a conceptual watershed or watershed scale hydrologic model, and it's designed to address many different things, including water management. Um, you can address sediment, climate change, land use change, or even agricultural chemical yield. So the applications of SWAT, they range in, from the field scale to watershed scale. And the reason that we are using it in this work is that our ADPC and our MRC partners were already implementing versions of the SWAT. And we came along and we thought, well, we could uh, further improve the functionality and utility of the SWAT by modifying it to adjust for model component, components that could uh, more readily ingest observations of satellites, uh, namely um, satellite-based precipitation, and we've updated the land use land cover data and some other things. A big part of this, when we first started, we said, well, a major component of the SWAT model, like I just mentioned, is land use. And the agricultural land use land cover types uh, vary throughout the Lower Mekong River Basin. And the figure that you, you see here, these, these are just nine different um, land use land cover types that were acquired from the Mekong River Commission. They provided examples, for example, of what their rain fed rice versus their irrigated rice or mixed annual crops, how they actually look. Now, previous to this work, the, the data set that was used for land use land cover change within the region dated back to pre-1997. So what we did is we worked with MRC and ADPC come up with an updated version of the land use land cover product by combining Landsat observations and MODIS observations. And a few um, important parts of this was that we, we updated the agricultural um, land use land cover types and the forest land use land cover types. And I'll, sh I'll go into a little bit of detail about how we did that. So this is the, the workflow we're deriving land use land cover maps. And what we used is 10, 2010 MODIS and MOD 9 eight day reflectance data. So it was processed into monthly NDVI maps with a time, time series product tool software package. And then we, we used that to classify regionally uh, common forest and agricultural land use land cover types. Um, I can't go into too much detail here, um, given the amount of time, but I, I strongly encourage everyone, if you have questions, uh, you can reach out to us or you could start with this, this paper led by 
uh, Joe Spruce that we published in 2019. And it goes into much more detail on this unsupervised classification and how we came up and, and derived this 2010 era um, plain use and land cover type data set. Here's an example of the 1997 and the 2010 land use land cover change map. And this is sort of a difference between the land use land cover uh, classes per date. Um, and so some, some obvious or some apparent uh, changes between the 1997 and 2010 uh, include the change in deciduous forest, a change in annual crops. There's more industrial forest plantations that were identified. And we have more annual crops um, for uh, throughout the region, including annual crops and urban expansion. And you can see here, it, it really just speaks for itself, the, the, the difference in um, the spatial distribution of the land cover classes in the, in the same page. So on the right, you see 1997 uh, land use land cover, and on the left is 2010 land use land cover. So we expect without any further improvement in the SWAP model that we would have a more realistic um, estimation of hydrologic modeling throughout the region just from applying this updated land use land cover type map. So some key points, the, the project um, through, throughout this point, it updated the land use land cover maps and for that region. And we did a, a, a very thorough accuracy assessment uh, through a number of the subbasins, and they showed higher overall agreements with the reference data. So over 80% agreement uh, with the reference data that was apply, applied. Um, and the, as a result from that work, the land use land cover maps are being used uh, in the lower Mekong, Mekong River Basin SWAT models to further aid in water and disaster management. And again, this is uh, the reference for this work. Now, SWAT uses many parameters to describe uh, typical soil and plant growth, land cover, reservoir, and even agricultural management characteristics. And when you're calibrating the SWAT model uh, for any region, it's important to have validation data. And I'd like to uh, give a big thanks to the Mekong River Commission and the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center for partnering with us in the calibration of this work. Um, so, using stream flow data, we were able to, to modify. Uh, these variables so they would have further agreement with this data. So the validation of the SWAT model was performed um, at the Lower American River Basin sub-basin outlets during a time period of 2001 to 2004 and 2007. So we, there was a range of values using the SWAT model calibration and they were we were consulted with and they were obtained from the SWAT developers uh, namely uh, Raghavan Srinivasan, who is also a co-investigator in this work, and he cited, cited in the next couple slides as well. So we did a, a sequential calibration procedure, and it was performed starting from, from the first sub-basin, and we went sub-basin to sub-basin uh, from each outlet, and we went downstream until we reached sub-basin outlet six. Um, and that resulted in producing a correction adjustment factors um, laying out to the corresponding sub-basins um, for each different outlet. And I'll, I'll show in the next few slides the hydrologic modeling um, and the sensitivity of, this, of these uh, parameters and how they related to the correction adjustment factors and precipitation forcing data. What's really interesting about this work is that we took a pre-existing uh, model that was readily used and trusted throughout the region, the SWAT model. And we tried to make the available NASA satellite precipitation data and other data sets um, workable, or, or we tried to create tools that would lend themselves to easily be ingested into the SWAT model. And so you see here on the, the top figure is this is annual precipitation throughout the region. And here is just a, an example of the mean annual um, Tem max temperature and minimum temperature throughout the basin. And the, here we see an iMERGE grid, with, which is the uh, GPM iMERGE. Um, it's the uh, merged product by uh, several different satellites that's provided by the NASA GPM mission. 
And again, this process and the calibration procedures are all uh, explaining mu much greater detail on the paper listed here. So you see here, for six sub-basins in the Lower Mekong River Basin, we compared the observed uh, stream flow with the simulated stream flow uh, for several years throughout the time period. So our sequential calibration from the upper Mekong Inlet to uh, the Karate and Cambodia are shown here. So in general, the model captured the timing onset of the, the seasonal discharge. Uh, it was slightly off in some of the estimates of peak flows um, that we're still, we're still addressing. So we, we used the NASH site clip um, uh, metric for validating the time period of the model and validating the performance of the, um, the model discharge through this. But overall, we had um, NSE estimates of 0.86 to 0.95, which is pretty good. So it has, the model has a 3.85% error on average in estimating monthly flows during the validation time period. So the Nash Sutcliffe efficiency um, shown here range from 0.96 to 0.94 and 0.93. So we also wanted to look at how applying remote sensing and gauge-driven SWOT models compared with the spring flow comparison throughout the region. So here just gives you a table format of the NSC compared with a remotely sense-driven only or an in-situ-driven model only um, using the same SWOT parameters and calibration procedure. And what we see in a, in a very important note that our results suggest that the model simulated stream flow utilizing satellite-based precipitation forcing data was able to capture the variability in the observed stream flow patterns better than the model simulated stream flow in in-situ precipitation station data. So that's a very, very um, exciting result for us by being, being able to replace the in-situ-based observations of precipitation and forcing data with satellite-based observations. One of the uh, issues in the Lower Mekong River Basin and really all over the world is that gauge-based precipi precipitation data are sparse. They're difficult to maintain, they're expensive, and sharing of data is, is, a, is a real issue. So if there's any way of, of, of overcoming those hurdles, namely by providing satellite-based observations, then that will lead to uh, a much more widely used SWOT model in this case. And if we're able to calibrate that using precipitation data and, and calibrate it and compare it with in situ based uh, stream flow data, it's a very exciting result for us. And I didn't mention it in the beginning, but I would also like to emphasize that all of this data and all of these results are um, free for public use. So all, all data and results that NASA provides are free and in the public domain, including this model and including the forcing data and tools that we use to derive this. So, um, so as you see here, this, this figure detects the ability of the Lower Mekong River Basin model to simulate discharge at various sub-basin outlets uh, using the GPM IMERGE precipitation data, forcing data. Uh, so it sort of explains between 71 to 96% um, of the variance observed in monthly discharge during the year, in this case, it was 2015, from some basin one to some basin six. So we note here that there is a slight difference in the, in the model performance when we compare it uh, with the model force GPM data and the trim data. And we, we're still working this out, but we attribute, we attribute that model performance difference to the adjustments to be made to the precipitation forcing data in the calibration of the model. Um, and we explain that in, in more detail in this paper, uh, but it was a really exciting result to compare the observed and simulated, or, or rather the remotely sensed forced um, SWAT model observations throughout the basin. So this next figure is, so if we have a calibrated model, um, how, can we, how can we use that model? You know, what, what can, how can we look at it and, and further assess and analyze 
you know, further impacts and extremes within the Lower Mekong River Basin. You know, one of the the issues of the of the the Mekong is it's it's widely used. It the many it serves many 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 purposes and it has and has many dams throughout um, throughout the Mekong River. So the issue is how does the stream flow variability change um, when you make adjustments upstream? And so this is a sensitivity analysis using uh, the Kawhile Index of Predictability. So what we've done is for the sensitivity analysis, we've made adjustments upstream and we looked at this predictability change. And what this allows us to do is we do a hypothetical experiment and, and we formulate it for a specific amount of water that's released upstream. Um, let's, for example, if we say that if 30% of the, the, of the existing flows conditions are increased upstream, how will, that, how will the predictability be downstream? And what we've seen here, throughout, if we look at this top basin here, you can see that the flow variability and predict predictability are changed and are very relevant to the amount of water that is changed or the dy dynamic variability upstream. Um, and we have a number of scenario analysis looking here, but the, the takeaway from this is that by using this calibrated model, we're able to conduct an experiment and show that the sensitivity analysis shows that the predictability of the river um, is in fact impacted by changing the amount of water that's provided into the stream upstream. And this is provided in much more detail in uh, Ibrahim Mohammed's paper uh, published in 2018, shown here. Another experiment we did when we had our calibrated model was looking at the, the high flow disturbance analysis. So sort of the, the flood duration analysis. And this is the flood duration in days or the number of days when discharge equals or exceeds the threshold discharge magnitude that would cause a flood. So the black bars here, uh, they give flood duration in days from 1960 to 2005 time period. Uh, and they're calculated from observed discharges shown here in blue. Now the blue bars, they get flood durations calculated from simulated discharges from the upper Mekong River Basin inflow. So if we increase the upper Mekong River Basin inflow by 30%, then we see what the impact would be for these flood duration days. And it's, um, it's a fun or it's an exciting to, uh, experiment to do if you look at the stream flow gauge discharges and what a possible increase upstream will have on the possible flood duration days downstream. And again, this is provided in much more detail in Muhammad's paper from 2018, shown here. A very exciting part of this work was, was trying to find a way of, of making the transition from satellite observation data to modeling data and modeled stream flow easier. And we came up with a wonderful tool called NASA Access. And NASA Access tool is a, is a tool for helping downloading and reformat NASA Earth observation data and data products, specifically for, in this case, the SWAP model. They can also be modified for other hydrologic models. And it's described in detail here, but I encourage anyone if you're if you're interested in how to take, for example, GPM data for your region of interest, if you want to reformat that data and provide it in a, in a format that's usable um, for your specific model, I strongly encourage you to look at the NAS Access tool. It was just accepted in GitHub uh, last week, I believe, so it's available, and I believe I have a link here. And we also show in, in this paper the description of NASA access tool. Here it is. This is the, the GitHub terminal for uh, joining GitHub. And it's a pretty simple script. And we'd be happy to help with you if you help you use this um, tool if you have questions. So an extension of our, our work is uh, we're partnering with Conservation International. And we're looking at how we can assist Conservation International in calculating the the freshwater health index um, 
using different reservoir scenarios in the lower Mekong River Basin. Uh, so this work is in progress um, and we've completed a, several um, runs using the calibrated SWAT model that I've just shown. Uh, looking at the freshwater health sensitivity analysis using different baseline scenarios and other, other dam scenarios um, that we can look and sort of assess what are the possible impacts of dams that are under construction or under contract and how they, they may impact um, uh, flow downstream. So we'll keep you posted on that. So uh, the next part of this presentation will be focused on near real-time real flood damage assessments. So the first part of the, the um, talk discussed the model stream flow and, and, and hydrologic analysis. Here what we're trying to do is use satellites for mapping flood, flood inundation. And not only just map the flood inundation, but what we're interested in doing is trying to characterize and quantify it, rather, the, the actual damage from that flood inundation. So as I mentioned earlier, this, the, this work goes, is targeting moving from data to decision making. Uh, so this shows the, the Earth observation workflow uh, for generating a near real-time routing information and uh, flood inundation mapping. So here we use MODIS imagery and it's ingested from the NASA LANT server uh, to produce server, surface water extents, shown up here. And the extents are then di digitized and used to estimate flood depths and damage estimates. And finally, these damage estimates uh, can be incorporated into emergency response operations shown here. And this is what we're, re we're really targeting, combining the surface flood extent mapping with, with socioeconomic damage information and then providing economic value of earth observations and i have a number of publications that we um that we have completed and have been accepted and they give this this whole um uh, transition this observation work or earth observation workflow in more detail but each different component uh our team has has derived in this case this is showing um, the, the flood inundation mapping over the lower mekong river basin and we provided a uh, in-depth accuracy assessment using over 7 million pixels uh, combined with different radar-based uh, observations. And we found an overall accuracy of, of 87%. Um, and accuracy ranged from 79% to 98%. And shown here, what you see here, this essentially what the way that the near real-time flood inundation maps are used is we we drive a baseline of uh, a modus based NDVI in the dry season and wet season, and changes or deviations from that baseline indicate areas of flooding. And then we, since we're using modus, which, which has um, a frequent overpass time, we have a, an operational near real time flood capability. So we understand there's some caveats here for it is not a radar based system. But most radar-based systems, even though they um, are, they can see through clouds, uh, they have um, longer or uh, less frequent repeat times. But by using MODIS data, we have more frequent repeat times. And you see here we have, on the right, you have the decrease in NDVI or your flooded areas. And we compare that with, this is ICER. These are actually uh, photographs taken from the um, International Space Station. And we also compare that with Landsat 7 observation uh, to drive our accuracy assessment. And I um, also point you to this, the, the paper mentioned here, which shows in greater detail how we did this. So the damage flood work and framework is, is an interesting concept here. Um, and what we did is that we, we tried to understand the estimates of flood depth calculate damages. So we followed an approach led by CHAM uh, in 2015, and we came up with a method that extracts the flood ex extent uh, using a detection tool. And it's, the concept is pretty simple. So you use a, a digital elevation map, 
and you assume um, a interpolated uh, network ten surface over the top. And this flat surface repre represents the water. If you take the difference between the ten and the DEM, that is your flood depth. So it's important to have, if you want to derive a flood extent boundary, an accurate flood extent boundary to have an accurate uh, DEM, um, that you can do this. But we've we found that this this method is uh, it's not too computationally expensive, and it can generate points around the perimeter, and you can sample elevation values from that DEM, and then your your triangulated irregular network or TIN will help you visualize the water surface elevation. And what we've shown is that not so we can go a step further than just providing a flood inundation mapping. We can provide uh, surface water elevation and flood depth. So these flood depth um, estimations, I mentioned that's important to have uh, a DEM. Here we have, we've used the, the merit DEM, it's the multi-error removed improved terrain DEM. And here is the reference for that DEM. And the reason we chose that is it provides uh, around a 20% um, increase in land area mapped with two meter or better vertical accuracy. So we found that that was a, an improved DEM for our purposes, and that's why we used it. So this shows the location of study um, in the description of the 2011 flood case. Uh, this is the 2011 Southeast Asia floods. It was a La Nina event with over 143% increase in rainfall um, at the onset of the Southwest monsoon. And this is a very widespread flood um, in Thailand, and we use this to demonstrate the utility of our um, near real time flood damage assistance system. And as shown in more detail at this paper led by Perry Otto in 2018 in the Journal of Hydrology. Some key parts of this is we, we also use the updated land cover product that I mentioned earlier that was uh, led by Joe Spruce uh, and also published um, last year. And this shows just a schematic of combining the population and infrastructure. So when we want to take this, the damage assessment, the damage estimates based on flood depth, and it's important to have population density, road network, and building footprints. And we use the, the NASA CDAC or Socioeconomic Data and Application Center data of gridded population density and global gridded roads or G roads. And we also use open source data, including building location and footprints from OpenStreetMap. So from this, the idea was to say, well, we can take the areas of, uh, that are being flooded, we can um, provide information on the population, the roads that are affected, and, and also the type of buildings that are being affected. So the damage calculations are, are relatively simple. The, the depth estimates that we, that we, um, we overlay depth, the depth raster onto the socioeconomic raster before calculating the per pixel damages. So it's a pretty simple and straightforward approach um, once you had your depth estimates and your damage factor. So we use the standardized method of damage calculations. It's similar to the US Army Corps of Engineers has us in the NH model, if you're familiar with that. Um, and different lane cover types are they're assigned to a maximum damage value, which are then evaluated based on the depth of the detected flooding. And this table here shows the maximum damage values for uh, several different land utilities. So for example, um, the land utility for rice totally destroyed is 0 0.078 um, US dollars per square meter. And we provided this source that we used for these maximum damage values for uh, calculating our, our standard method shown here. And these estimates are, are provided, here's the reference for COC in 2004. And these show the dam damage, depth damage curves um, over the general and the rice specific land cover types. And you can see here as the inundation depth increases, you have a damage factor that also increases. 
and this rate of increase is dependent on the lane cover type. And you see here, if we're visualizing impacts, um, so the, the uh, lane utility and the area covered and the damages that were covered throughout that event are shown here. So the results show here, we have a heat map actually, that is, uh, the heat map is an estimated damage showing the areas which are more likely to have costly impacts based on the detected flooding. Um, so the damages are inherently uncertain due to the uncertainty surrounding the, the flood depths, but it gives us a way of identifying regions uh, for more thorough investigations. So it provides you a, a sort of a near real time a quick response capability of saying, well, this area over here shows that we have uh, much higher um, depth estimates, and damage estimates based on that land cover and depth, depth rating curve I mentioned earlier. Again, this is provided in more detail in auto in 2018. So there are a few limitations of the current system. Um, I mentioned before the accuracy of the DEM, the accuracy um, of, the, of the MODIS based data. MODIS cannot see through cloud, so you can only have these, these observations in cloud-free scenes. Um, and so there are a number of ways that we're, we're working to further improve and refine this process. Um, so really, right now, it, it only investigates direct tangible impacts, so damages caused by direct contact with water that can be readily quantified using existing methods. Um, a more comprehensive flood impact evaluations will try to account for indirect or intangible impacts. And that's what we've shown here. So how will these flood, these flood events have indirect or intangible impacts? Um, it's more difficult to parameterize and quantify. So we're still working on that. But we know that there are definitely impacts from agricultural production, loss of income in industry, for example, and increased emergency evacuation costs from um, having such a flood event. Um, a very important part of all this work, as I mentioned, is, is working closely with stakeholders. And I'd like to give um, uh, a big thanks to our partners and stakeholders in the Mekong region, the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center, and the Mekong River Commission. And this picture shows uh, the regional workshop on near real time flood monitoring service and that was held and hosted by ADPC and NASA's Severe Mekong in Bangkok, Thailand in 2018. What's exciting about this work is that we were able to um, put in place or uh, have a demonstration of this partnership with ADPC uh, last year. So there was a, a very serious dam break in Laos and we we're able to implement the system and come up with quick estimates of the, the area that was affected, the number of buildings, affected roads, and the, the damage in US dollars of potential infrastructure and land cover shown here. This just provides an example in more detail on how this was done. And further is the value and of near real time earth, earth observations. We're trying to capture and say what is the monetary value of for example, response time for if you we provide our partners with this near real time flood damage assessment system, exactly how is that quantified um, for what is the value of that information? And so that's that's on the horizon for us, and we're eager to to uh, figure that out. Finally, I'd like to talk about the Tethys app, and this is a very exciting tool. We've been partnering with them. Um, Bingham Young University, Jim Nelson and his team, they've developed an app called Tethys. And it's used for visualizing and sharing inputs and outputs of many different data sets and models. And we've been partnering with uh, Dr. Nelson's team in developing this Tethys app for visualizing uh, the SWOT model shown here. And if, if anyone's interested, you can go to this website and explore the Tethys app. I'm going to give you a very quick summary of what it does, and it's not just for visualizing data. What's what's great is that you can download and get an um, ASCII summary tables of the data sets and modeled output using the Tethys app. So this is 
what we're after here, you, you see an example of a hydrograph for a specific uh, part of the Lower Mekong River Basin that was selected, and you can modify this based on time. And when you choose your time, uh, your region of interest and your time of interest, you can select monthly or daily data, and you can download this data accordingly. I'm going to speed up this a little bit. This is a very long video. But you can download the individual uh, forcing data that was used and some selected SWOT model outputs. Here we see uh, they're selecting soil water content and precipitation. And they're visualizing that, that output. And then you can download this data. And it provides um, in a table format. So. so that's it. This is also a summary of data sources that were provided for that neural time flood data set. And again, here are the links to ADPC and Mekong River Commission. And finally, here are a few pictures of us at different meetings and workshops we've had with our regional partners. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone for joining me today and talking about applied remote sensing for transboundary water resource management in the Lower Mekong River Basin. And I'd like to acknowledge um, all the people that worked on this. A few of them include Ibrahim Mohammed, Joe Spruce, Perry Otto, Venkat Lakshmi, Dr. Hung, Raghavan Srinivasan, Colin Doyle, Dr. Nguyen, Jim Nelson, um, Spencer McDonald, and Penn Machia. Thank you very much. And that completes this presentation. Uh, thank you, John, so much for that. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we're very honored uh, right now to be joined by Dr. Ibrahim Mohammed and Perry Otto, both from the Hydrological Sciences Lab here at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. They're colleagues of Dr. Bolton's, and they will be helping out with the Q&A session. So for those who have any questions, please feel free to send them to the chat box, and we will address them over the coming 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Ibrahim Mohammed. Um, so I have a question here um, about how does the level of land use, land cover classification affect the performance of SWAD model? And yes, this is a very good question because the classification of the land use, land cover uh, affects the calculation of the water balance component. As we know, in the SWAD model, we are simulating the stream flow output. And this stream flow output is a function of the evapotranspiration and is a function also of the ground um, water um, seepage. Uh, so the more we have classes of land cover land use, we will be able to calculate ET because um, just if you think um, if you have a very broad classification uh, of agriculture land versus having a detailed classification of agriculture land, this means um, a very significant difference in calculating ET. Um, as we know here, we have rice, um, we have some areas that they use uh, multiple crops, and we would like to basically be able to. Um, calculate ET um, accurately, and this will result in simulating out stream flow outflow uh, accurately. So the more we have land use, land cover classes, and subclasses, types of forests, um, and uh, this will basically help in getting us uh, a better results uh, in simulating stream flow output.
So I have another question is, how do you find the density of in-situ gauges required to calibrate the remote sensing data? Um, actually, in this exercise, um, we have not calibrated the remote sensed data. We have calibrated the SWAD model to simulate the stream flow, and we calibrated the stream flow output of the SWAD model to the observed stream flow measured by our uh, partners in the Mekong region. So we used uh, uh, as an exercise two uh, experiments. We uh, drove the, the SWAT model with in situ um, data that we obtained from different um, sources in the Mekong region. And then also we drove the SWAT model with the remote uh, sensing data, and we compared the results. So what we have found is we have found that the remote sensing data is able to um, simulate the stream flow better than the in situ gauges because the density of the in situ gauges available in the region is very poor and also the variability is not captured uh, so the remote sensing data products were able to basically give us a better estimate of um, stream flow output and we assessed that by comparing the stream flow output from both uh, model scenarios with the observed uh, stream flow that we have obtained as i said from our our uh, uh, region partners Hi everyone, this is Perry Otto. Okay, so we have a question um, about how the flood depths are estimated using the uh, TIN network. And so um, this is a method that we found um, in the literature as a way to kind of broadly estimate uh, inundation depths from the flood extent. So this is covered in uh, slides 30 and 31, I believe where we overlay the detected flood extent onto our um, digital elevation model and around the perimeter of the extent where the water meets the land surface, we extract the land elevation um, at those points. And then so what we do is create a TIN network using the elevations of the perimeter extents, um, which gives us some estimate of the flood surface elevation, which allows us to then um, subtract the underlying DEM to get some estimate of the flood depths. I also had a question about how we derived the value for the maximum damage per unit and category. Um, for the actual damage assessment. These were units that we actually found uh, regionally derived values from the literature. Um, we wanted to be able to find um, established values that were um, created for, I believe, areas in Thailand and Vietnam. Um, and so we're kind of broadly applying those values throughout the entire basin, which has its own um, uncertainties and assumptions inherent in it. Um, that's an area for future research is to kind of better constrain the kind of regionally and locally specific damage values for each country and community. Another question we had was, um, does the NDVI um, flood detection approach um, have issues confusing um, flooded areas with, say, rice fields? And so that's a great question. Um, the near real-time flood detection component of the research was undertaken by um, 
a researcher, Akash Ahmed. Um, and so that uses kind of a rolling um, eight-day NDVI, which does uh, change dynamically depending on the day of interest. So it, it does take into account seasonal variations. In this approach, um, permanent water bodies are masked out, but there may be some um, confusion over kind of ephemeral water bodies or areas that uh, maybe have suspended sediment or silty or, or could potentially be partially flooded fields. And so that's an area of continued research. Um, there's efforts underway to do some field sampling and in situ measurements to kind of better constrain um, those areas that are not as easily detected as truly inundated. Yes, this is Ibrahim again. Um, I have a question here that says, one important issue is regarding the replicability of this ex excellent work in other latitudes. Are the developed tools open source and available to other agencies? How these interactions of NASA CV with other partners would work to extend the utility of your work? Yes, actually, this is a fantastic question. Um, our work is completely uh, can be replicated and it is also open source and as we have uh, said this is available in github so that actually the, the the main objective of this work is to be used by other agencies and other people because the nasa access for example this is a tool that can extract reformat and uh, produce um, weather and climate data everywhere so just if you have a watershed shape file basically you upload that to the url or if you are uh, our user you download the package and you just give uh, the link to this watershed and automatically the tool will do all the work it will go and fetch the data from nasa server it will reformat it it will extract only the desired time span for your um, data that you would you would like and then it will produce ASCII files that can be uh, ingested into any other modeling environment um, this nasa access uh, has also um, a climate change dimension um, so for example if you wanted to do any climate change study and you are interested to do a cmap5 uh, with, uh, analysis from different um, climate models and different um, climate scenarios, you can easily plug these uh, inputs in the function and, and it will do the work for you. It will go and get you the, um, the precipitation, the air temperature that you wanted for the specific model for the time period uh, span that you would like. And with also the, the, the SWAD online, the SWAT online that is um, uh, uh, Tetis app, uh, it is available on GitHub also. And it is not only um, customized with the lower Mekong, it can, the framework is able to basically be uh, applied everywhere. So if you have a SWAT model um, uh, in any area, you basically have the platform and you put the data from your model into the platform and it will basically do the same functions that you have seen in the video. You can uh, visualize your inputs, you can uh, analyze your outputs, and it is, uh, as I said, a fantastic tool that can be basically used in a very wide range of applications. Hello, this is Perry again. Uh, we had a question about how did we use and apply uh, the HAZUS, uh, USGS hazard calculator. And so in this, um, for the damage assessment component, we used um, a similar framework of kind of a damage standardization framework um, that was similar to HAZUS, but not exactly the same. Um, we wanted to use 
um, the model called the standard method, which had also been regionally applied um, in the Mekong Basin before. But it, it operates on um, in a similar fundamentals as the Hazus model in that we have um, different depth damage curves for different land cover types, different infrastructures. Um, but it is not primarily, the Hazus is more primarily used for kind of domestic uses. So we instead um, use the standard method, which we can provide more information for if needed. Yes, this is Ibrahim again. Um, we have a question about what are the effects of land of the land cover changes on water balance components in your assessment. Um, yes, uh, land cover changes uh, do affect the water balance components. Um, uh, we have not explored this into our experiment, um, but uh, we are aware of any um, land cover changes would basically change the ET would change the ground infiltration. It will change the groundwater storage. So, um, as I said, this is um, uh, as this has not been done in our analysis because uh, we have used um, uh, land cover land use change layer from 2010. And um, if we uh, basically have another uh, land cover land use layer we will be able to um, run it again in our model and see how this would um, impact uh, the water balance component. Thank you very much, uh, John, for the presentation, and also uh, Perry, Otto, and Ibrahim Mohammed for helping us with all the question and answers. Um, if if you have any more questions, please uh, put them in the uh, questions uh, chat box. We will have our last session next week at the same time in which we will be using GLDAS to estimate and look at different freshwater components over Parana River Basin and also Potomac River Basin. We'll use a number of NASA tools and QGIS just to look at maps, also time series of changing uh, water components. So we hope to see you next week at the same time. If there are no more questions, we'd like to thank you for attending today's session. Thank you everyone for participating today and we hope to see you next week at the same time. Thanks. <laughs>